Hi, welcome to this tutorial on some production techniques. We're not going to be talking about technical applications of whatever media capture software that you might be using, whether it's screencastomatic.com or explain everything. These are going to be more of, I guess, uh, things that I've learned as far as production and trying to get that little extra professional look onto your videos. So, but I don't pretend to be a professional. Um, but uh, just you know, some things that I have learned through trial and error of shooting hundreds and hundreds of videos out there um, that I think uh, makes them look a little bit more appealing. And the first one is the, the most important one, and that is the eye-camera relationship. We have so many videos from both instructors uh, anywhere, all over, uh, whether it's this program, other programs, other schools, and students, same thing where they're using their laptops to produce their video. Uh, the laptops have a camera built into it. Laptops are obviously usually set on the desk, right? You open it up and you, you know, you've got the screen and the camera is pointed up at you. We have all of these wonderful videos of basically what I call nostril shots, where the video is actually going right up the nostrils of the uh, presenter because of the way that the camera is angled and shooting up at the individual. So that's an easy fix, very easy to fix. Doesn't cost anything. You can fix it with things around your home. And all you really need to do is to take that laptop and build it up so the camera is level with your eyes and probably shooting right about right about here for you. A um, Couple ways I've done this. I'll show you my layout here in just a moment. But uh, what I used to do is um, how you'd have uh, bricks. You could use bricks. And then I had a board and I, um, it made like a little uh, you know, stand with the bricks and then the board on the top, and then I set my laptop on top of it, and that brought it to uh, level height. So that usually that usually works. Um, you could do other things, books or what have you. Some people have those standing desks, which are really cool if you can bring it up that high. Um, but if with a little creativity, you can find something that you can bring that camera so it's shooting straight at your eyes. Okay, that'll, that'll reduce the dreaded nostril shot, or uh, it's also called the I'm looking down at you shot because you're looking down at the person, um, and if the person tilts up, then you're looking up their nostril or they're looking down at you, and it can be kind of a, a little intimidating uh, shot as well. So build up your laptop, go with that eye contact, that eye level uh, relationship with the camera. The next thing is framing. I see a lot of what I call uh, uh, unusual framing issues uh, and that is where where you are positioned you are you you are positioned within the frame of the video I like to have a little just a little space between me and the top of the frame I think that works um, I could probably be a smidge higher right now or a smidge closer to the camera that will take care of that a little bit tighten that up um, what I see are <clears throat> from and student, again, students, instructors all over the place is a couple of errors. One of them is that with the framing of their head and shoulders, they'll be down in the center. Oh, I should be in the middle, right? Well, my eyes right now are pretty much, as I look at the screen here, are pretty much in the middle. But does that look normal? You get this little head and all of this space here. So you want to uh, make sure that you're sitting up into the space and kind of taking some command of the frame, you know, with your torso in here. For me, it's actually, I look at this button uh, and I make sure that I've got that button and that level is, is captured, you know, a torso up. You don't want to capture just the show. I've seen little shoulder. I used to do this. You'd be little shoulders. Why'd that look weird? And then I figured it out, you know, if I just pushed it down, I actually looked at other people and what they were doing. And why does that shot look good and my shot doesn't look good? Um, and it's really just positioning up, you know, bringing the frame kind of, whoops, up to about here and taking more, more command of, of the picture. So... I think that works. I think it looks a little bit more uh, more appealing. So watch your framing. With that framing, check. do a background check. Is there anything weird in the background? Anything distracting? Now, uh, in my case, what I've tried to do is made, uh, I've tried to actually create an eclectic background that wasn't distracting, but had some visual appeal in there. 
Um, I normally have, if, every, if you've ever been to my office over the years, people would comment, I have nothing personal in my office. It's a little strange. So the only reason I've I have brought in little tchotchkes and whatnot is to and and positioned these things in the background is strictly for the videos that I shoot. Um, even the black that I've put onto the board here onto the onto my little closet was to uh, tone down that wood grain that was in there. So again, um, my attempt to make it look a little bit interesting, but not. Um, uh, not distracting, hopefully, is my intent. Uh, so do a background check. Is there anything weird that you don't want your viewers to see or they may focus on? The major no-nos are pets. I have seen pets in videos. I have seen TVs that are going in the back of videos. Avoid that. So shoot. try to find a nice neutral setting for you to shoot your videos uh, with your background. The background, don't, um, we uh, occasionally get what I call the mugshot video, where the person is right up against the wall, right up against that wall, uh, it, or the, the firing squad video. They, they position themselves right up against that white blank wall. Pull yourself back from the wall. That makes it look a little bit more natural, too, and, and uh, actually makes it, I don't know how magic works, makes you look more relaxed rather than sitting right up against a wall. So uh, make sure that your background isn't too close to you, even if it's something as neutral as a, you know, a white wall or a, a blank wall in your house. Pull yourself back uh, from that a little bit. Um, all right, so that discusses uh, the eye contact, the eye level camera relationship and framing. Let's talk about lighting. So we are using the cameras and your laptops for the most cases. You don't have to go out and buy a camera. Just use what's in there, but they're very light hungry. So you will want to make sure that you have turned on the lights. You want some illumination to make it to make the colors pop a little bit. Also to take away, whoops, sorry about that, to take away some of the shadows that might uh, be cast onto your face. So uh, do that. You want to have more light uh, generally behind the camera um, shooting towards you than behind you and shooting into the camera. So <clears throat> try to avoid shooting um, with a window in your background or anything that's going to produce a backlight uh, that's going to, you know, kind of be very hard to fight that backlight. Regular ambient light is good. <clears throat> there's kind of like light all around, but there's not like a single glaring source coming this way into the camera. Now, I do have some glaring sources actually coming from behind the camera and onto my face. <clears throat> and I'll show you that in just a few moments. So um, be careful about the light. If it doesn't look right, again, you don't have to go out and buy anything. A couple of lamps may be moved around in your home and positioned behind the camera and projecting onto you is usually enough to, to solve the problem. Next is sound. <clears throat> so the sound is usually something, if you buy, have to buy anything, you might have to buy something like this. The, the sound in my, the sound within the laptops usually is not good enough. Um, do a test, it might be fine. But if you sound like you're in a cave or it's very echoey or whatnot, you may have to buy a little you know, headset mic like I have here. You can get them on Amazon, $10, $15. I like the one with just the mono, not the double ears. Whatever. You could do whatever you want. You could also do, um, let's see if I have one here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, got one right here. <laughs> so you can get a little stick mic like this. That works pretty good too. It brings it brings the, the sound... Um, receiver away from the laptop. These are about $10. Okay, they work really well. You don't have to go out and buy fancy mics unless you're really into it. I got some fancy mics, but I find I myself just using this $15 headset uh, more often than not. All right, so check out your sound and make sure, uh, make sure that works. Then uh, lastly, you're going to be, you're going to be lecturing typically. Uh, you might be shooting your your weekly vlog videos, your kind of week in review videos, you're going to be doing those, but you're also going to be doing your lectures, and those are going to be PowerPoints, and you're going to have to advance slides on PowerPoints. Uh, I see this all of the time, uh, especially with students, and um, 
I, you know, it's uh, I got a little a little name for it. It's called the earthquake, right? So they advance the slide, and I, every time they advance it, they go to their laptop and they they hit the the arrow key, and I get this for every one. You don't want to touch your laptop while you're recording. Uh, you want it to be as still as possible to avoid any kind of camera jiggle uh, whatsoever. So <clears throat> how do you solve that? A little external wireless mouse. Use that to click and advance your slides. Um, it'll it'll take care of uh, take care of that for you. Again, these don't have to get fancy. It doesn't even need to be wireless. It just needs to be away from the laptop. You know, ten dollars. If not, you probably got one laying around the house. All right, so you've got that. Um, and uh, lastly, let's see. I'm looking at my little checklist here. Lastly, uh, time. So what does that mean? With your lectures, try to keep them chunked into time intervals of <clears throat> no more than about 15 minutes. <clears throat> now, you may have to exceed that in some cases. That's okay, but be conscious of that. Try to keep them chunked. Really, the target would be about 10 minutes per lecture. Why is that the sweet spot? Well, uh, attention spans, all of our attention spans, uh, you know, really are stretched when you begin to go beyond that 15 minute mark. So 10 is good. Um, you know, students can watch a 10 minute lecture pretty easily. And then if um, for you, if you have to um, recreate it for any reason, you only have a 10 minute lecture to recreate versus a 30 minute lecture to recreate or to do a lot of video editing or whatnot. It makes it so much easier. We call it chunking. <clears throat> There's another benefit too. You may want to deploy these videos in different areas, different times, maybe even different courses. So if you chunk your videos, your lectures, really to focus on a, a particular um, content, um, that I think works out the best. So if you have, a, I don't know, I'm making this up, um, you know, uh, various uh, questions that you would use in the interview process uh, for healthcare workers, you know, maybe you're teaching the HR class, you have a little video on that. And then you have a video on um, things that are illegal to discuss during the interview process. So if things ever change or you want to deploy all those little chunked videos, you've got a little library of videos, much more easy to deploy or to fix if you need to fix one. Also, be very, very careful. Try not to do this. I did this and learned the hard way that uh, to make any references to time uh, or textbook. So make no references to, I guess, you know, well, today is Thursday or today the president did this, this and this. Um, avoid that. Try to make your lectures somewhat timeless so you don't have to re-record them. Textbooks too. Uh, I made a series of videos where I referred to page numbers in textbook, in a textbook. Textbook edition changed. They moved pages around, and you know the chart that was on page 89 is now on page 104. So it really uh, made me think that I need to not tie in my lecture to any specific content within a textbook. So I can definitely draw upon the textbook, but I'm not referencing referencing that book uh, in in any way, shape, or form. So um uh you know be careful with that knowing i mean you know for sure textbooks are going to change now obviously there can be major content changes within your discipline let's say the affordable care act gets repealed um yes you know then you're shooting new lectures all over uh for whatever would replace you know the affordable care act or whatnot so yeah you're going to have enough of that i guess don't try to create any situations um that you can avoid by trying to be as timeless as possible and not referencing uh any external sources that could be changed on uh on you even your own course be very careful about you know even referencing uh any assignments within your own course because you're like oh geez i changed that but i talk about it in the lecture Again, try to keep it as standalone uh, as uh, as possible. All right, so those are some of the keys that I'd like you to go away with as you begin to produce 
your uh, your lectures and also your kind of your even your little one-off videos that you might be doing now as promised let me show you my setup and what I do um, again you don't have to replicate this but uh, if you wanted to replicate something like this, I think the whole cost on this was about $40 to, re to replicate it, um, all purchased off of Amazon. So, <clears throat> but you could do it for free. So let me show you. I'm moving the webcam around here. So I've got my uh, light sources. I got two LED, uh, basically task lamps, um, but I angle them and, and bring them towards my face. And then I've got my laptop. Um, on this little cool little laptop stand um, that uh, angles it, uh, that gives me that height. And I have my this webcam I'm holding here. Uh, I set it on top here. I just like using a webcam versus my uh, internal webcam. Not necessary. And I also have, um, you probably saw my eyes moving around a little bit, but there are my little show notes. As I'm talking to you, I want to make sure I talk about eye, light, sound, mouse, background, time. So I had those in front of me too. Um, just to prompt me to make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover in this particular tutorial. All right, so we'll bring the camera back. And I don't like the border on my, my wallpaper border. There we go. All right. So there you go. There are some tips and techniques uh, I think that will help uh, with um, you know the production uh, of your of your videos. Um, one of the I do get one question that I, I'm, I'm seeing on here too about uh powerpoint style that's very personal i guess I, I should say uh some people have some very passionate views on powerpoint believe it or not there are web pages and web pages and blogs and videos and all kinds and books all about powerpoint and how it should look i personally am of the camp that um uh, less is more on PowerPoint. So with your slides, if you are, uh, you know, having just three to four uh, simplified conceptual bullet points, I think is absolutely fair to do. And then your lecture can be around those bullet points. Um, some people like some very detailed slides. Uh, whether the students are grasping those detailed slides, you know, I don't know, or they're using them as a crutch versus taking notes, you know, up to you. I mean, whatever, I guess, whatever way we get to them learning their, their learning objectives um, and how you're assessing that, and if it's working for you, great. Um, for me, though, simple PowerPoint slides, simple bullet points, maybe with some nice um, visuals, no clip art. I try to use like real. <clears throat> real pictures, uh, public domain pictures <clears throat> on there, that seems to uh, seems to help and makes it easier. I don't spend a, I don't spend a ton of time, <clears throat> excuse me, a ton of time making uh, PowerPoints. I mean, I did, there's still time to be taken, but, um, or I even sometimes I'll take the publisher PowerPoints and clean them up and, you know, make them a little bit more in my own style, if you're lucky enough that the textbook has any decent publisher provided PowerPoints. Um, so uh, just some some food for thought on that. Uh, but I'll leave that up to you. Feel free to Google. You can Google PowerPoint design theory and there'll be hundreds of experts out there. Uh, I do that occasionally just to get some ideas um, about you know what they look like and I go, oh that's really cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna mimic that particular style in my PowerPoint. So take some time, develop your own style. Uh, that you have. The one thing that I would encourage you to do, though, is whatever PowerPoints that you create and that you're eventually going to capture through lecture, but turn those PowerPoints into a PDF handout. Very easy, like two clicks. Print, handout. <laughs> That's all you have to do. Uh, you want to do typically three slides to a page. I think we've all done this. So we've all had you know, seminars and training, and they have the three slides to the page, and then they have a little note section on there. So provide that to your students. So they'll have your video, your video link, and under that you'll put PDF of PowerPoints. And then they'll be able to click on that and have that PDF available. They really do appreciate that. I did that in one, one class, I didn't provide it, and they were like all over me. Chris, can I please have the PDFs? I'm like, oh yeah, sorry guys, I forgot to put them in there. So, um, 
they really, really do appreciate the PDFs uh, of your PowerPoint that you use. If you use PowerPoints, there are some lectures where you may be using um, uh, in a uh, basically a whiteboard style where you're just writing, which you can do. We talked about some previous uh, some technologies within Screencast-O-Matic where you can basically just be writing like on a, 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 a blank canvas. That's obviously not a PowerPoint, so you don't have to do it for everything. But I would say in general, 95% of what we do will be PowerPoint based. So I think you can produce uh, handouts uh, in that case. All right. So there you go. There's some little tips and techniques for production. I hope this has helped. Thank you.